My name is Kayla Maines. I'm the co-chair 2020 for the AIA Austin BEC group. Um, we'd like to begin by thanking our committee sponsors, Terracon Facilities, WJE, and JE Dunn, DuPont Tyvek, and Chamberlain. They do a lot for our group. They, um, they not only sponsor us, but they also are part of our board and also they contribute their spaces for events for and for mock-up building and those kinds of things. They also support the greater mission of the AIA Austin. They serve several of the committees such as Design Voice, Latinos in Architecture, Women in Architecture, and Architecture K through 12. The BEC would like to announce that next week we're going to host a discussion and we're calling this discussion the AIA BEC Committee Check-In. So what we're, we're wanting to do is just do a check-in during this COVID virus spread. And uh, it's having a great effect on our society. So we wanted to spend a few minutes with our, our friends and colleagues that are part of the BEC group and just kind of check in with you and see how you're doing and see if there's anything the BEC can do for you. So please plan on joining those sessions. They're going to be Wednesday, April 8th at noon. The first one's gonna be led by George Wil uh, Wilcox with Clayton Little Architecture. And the next will be April 15th at noon. And that's gonna be led by Christoph Irwin with Positive Energy. So today's presentation is silicone sealants and coatings for buildings, construction and res restoration, excuse me. And uh, Jennifer Hutchins, uh, the account manager for Dow Chemical Company is our presenter. If you could go ahead and write your questions in the box as she presents, I'll be happy to moderate those. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, thanks everybody. Hi everyone, as Kayla said, my name is Jennifer Hutchison. Um, I am the uh, technical representative for uh, Dow in the construction area. Uh, I am based in Houston um, and today I am in uh, supporting in quarantine with my husband, uh, my two cats and my dog. So I apologize in advance if any of them make appearance in the background behind me. Um, but today, I'm sure is, you know, the struggles we're all dealing with and, and working from home. So today, uh, you know, as Kayla mentioned, we're talking about silicone sealants and coatings. Um, if you're familiar with the previous and Heritage Dow Corning products, uh, that has now become uh, Dow. So those are the products that we're going to, um, the, this, this product line, um, but specifically today looking at um, how silicone sealants um, overall perform in uh, construction and restoration. Jennifer, just to interrupt you really quick, we already got a really good question. Um, are these slides going to be available later or should people be taking screenshots as the presentation goes on? You can take screenshots for, for a, a quick reference because this slide, I will warn you, is pretty lengthy, um, uh, but I can certainly send these out afterwards. Yep. Just want to jump in and say, hi, this is Julia from AIA Austin. Just want to say this meeting is being recorded and um, good point. that mm -hmm. will be available to anyone um, just by requesting it through my email, which I have put in the chat box. Very good. Thanks. So today, quite a few learning objectives. Um, first off, one being understanding the difference between silicone and organic sealants. There are differences um, in how they perform and, and maybe which applications might be better for which chemistry sets. Then looking at the different types of sealant properties uh, and again, which which properties uh, provide which types of are again fit with fit which applications best. Um, we'll look at some some details, um, some good and some bad. We will look at some structural versus weather seal applications, again, looking at specific designs. We'll get into some failures and looking at how and why sealants fail. Uh, and again, looking at the, the benefits of silicone overall as far as sealants um, for coatings, for sealants and coatings in construction or restoration. So again, as Kayla mentioned, any questions that come up, um, feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll address them as we go through. 
So in the world of sealants, there's a lot of different options, right? There's one component, two component. There's, I mean, as far as chemistry goes, there's a lot of different options. There's silicones, polyurethanes, acrylics, hybrids, um, and they all do different things. They all have different performance characteristics. Um, and they all have kind of downstream effects too, right? On paintability, compatibility, those types of things. There's, there's many different aspects to consider um, when writing specifications, as well as considering different applications. Longevity is another one to consider. Um, and then overall, the, the cost of your project is another aspect to consider. So for my chemists in the house, I promise I won't go too, too in depth in this, um, but there are two broader categories of sealants to consider. The first being an organic, which at the core of it is this carbon to carbon and carbon to oxygen backbone. What this means and why this is important to us in construction is that over time, the UV and the energy from the UV and the sunlight can break down this carbon to oxygen and carbon to carbon bonds. Whereas the inorganic based polymer with the silicone to oxygen bonds has enough bond strength to withstand that UV energy. And I'll show you a visual example again of what this means for us in construction is this visual here. Let me get my little pointer. Apologies, new to whatever version this is, Zoom. Um, okay, so we can see here, left-hand side of this little visual, this is a silicone and this is an organic sealant, specifically a polyurethane. This has been aged 2,400 hours in a UV chamber. And picturing this on the exterior of a building, what this can look like, right? So if we go to what the role of a sealant is, keeping, which is the next slide, I believe. No. Um, but at the end of the day, what the role of a sealant is, is keeping the air and moisture on the proper sides of the building where they need to be, right? Keeping uh, the air and moisture out of the building. So over time, as you can see, that carbon to oxygen and carbon to carbon bond is going to break down and degrade this organic sealant. And again, that's just the broader category of organic. So when we're talking, um, why is chemistry important? This is why it's, it's longevity. So when we're looking and talking about building, you know, 50 year, you know, buildings, all building components can play a role in that even even sealants. And these are just some ways um, that the sealants can deteriorate, hardening, cracking, um, reverting is one as well. So again, we talked about what is the role of the sealant. We talked about keeping um, the air and water out of the building, you know, preventing that air intrusion. Another uh, key component and an important performance aspect of the sealant is to allow for building movement. So if you think about all of the different building components that we have on a construction site, your glass, your aluminum, your concrete, um, all the different types of plastics, um, they all have different coefficient th of thermal expansions. And what that means is during your thermal cycles, whether it's during the day, over the year, uh, you know, an entire year, is your building's going to expand and contract. And so your sealant needs to be able to accommodate that movement. And that leads us right into um, the properties of the sealants. Now, this is a very important question that I get very frequently on, okay, sealant manufacturer, why do you have seven different sealants and, and what do they do? What are, what are the different performances, right? Why, why can't you just have one that does it all? Well, that's, that's a great question and this slide kind of talks about it. So first one is you want your sealant to have good adhesion. Uh, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me walk that back a little bit. There's different levers that you can pull. Uh, so for our chemists in the lab, when they're mixing up the sealants and talking about additives and things, there's things that we can increase and decrease. And these are some of the levers that we can pull. So first one being adhesion. Again, just is it going to adhere to a, to a substrate? Um, the next two, I think, kind of go hand in hand the way I describe them. So the first is modulus, and I describe that kind of as the umbrella. So think of modulus as, like I said, the umbrella, whereas your movement capability is the quantification of that modulus. So for example, um, a very high modulus 
sealant is going to be very stiff. It's not going to have a high movement capability, whereas a low modulus sealant is going to have a high movement capability. It's going to have about 100% um, movement capability, 100% plus. So low modulus means high movement capability. High modulus means uh, sorry, high modulus means low movement capability, if that makes sense. So again, your modulus is kind of your quantification, or modulus is your umbrella, and the movement capability of your quantification. Because in, say, a medium modulus, you can have a 75%, a 50%, you know, it's, it's a, a categorization in there. So movement cap capability, to, talking to the previous slide, depending on the movement of anticipated in your joints that you have in your building, uh, something you need to consider with your sealants. Is your sealant going to be able to accommodate the movement in your anticipated in your joints? And the next one we talked about, you know, going back to the chemistry of it, I mean, this is literally at an atomic level, the chemistry of it, is your sealant um, durable enough to, to stand up to the UV for years and years to come? Um, Jennifer, to say, mm -hmm. UV, we received a question. If your sealant joint will not be exposed to UV, will polyurethane and silicone sealants degrade at approximately the same rate? That's a really great question. Um, not having a chemistry background, being in the lab myself, I don't have the data to support that. Um, I have an engineering background, so I'm, I'm, I'm more field oriented in my role. Um, it would be expected that they would have similar performance, absolutely. And, and that's, that's the kind of the point in that slide, right? So if we're talking building exterior, your, your UV is, is gonna be a significant factor in, in degradation. Um, but in interior sealants, you know, your acrylics, your, your polyurethanes, that's not, a, that's not a, a factor that you need to consider. So very good question. So as we talked about um, the, the chemists in the lab, those are some levers that we can pull. So when you're talking about the different sealants, they have, you know, each manufacturer is going to have a, a, a sealant line. Each of those sealants are going to have different sealant performances. So, so one sealant may have great adhesion to porous substrates, um, but require primer on metals. Uh, and it may have a high modulus capability. So uh, in the analogy I like to use is coffee. So if you're someone that likes a lot of creamer, a lot of sugar in your coffee, there comes a saturation point, right? Where you can only add so much sugar, so much creamer in your coffee to where it can't absorb in your coffee anymore. It, it starts to sink to the bottom. It's a very similar concept um, at a high level with sealants. You can only put so many additives and so many things into your sealants before you start, you know, it, it can only absorb so much before you reach that saturation point. So another thing to consider with performance, um, again, getting into to longevity and, and thermal cycles um, is how the sealants perform over time, uh, time and temperatures. So the bottom two lines, um, the orange and the red, if you can see those colors okay, those are silicone. Um, the top two, the purple and the yellow, are polyurethanes. On your axes, on your x-axis, you have the percent elongation, so how much it stretched, right? And then on your top line is how much stress was applied to get that stretch. So what this graph is telling you is essentially the inorganic sealants, the silicones, are virtually unaffected by colder temperatures or by temperature swings. At zero degrees and at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see these two lines are very, the stress applied is very, very close. We're at what, 15 and maybe 17, 18 PSI, whereas the difference in the organic um, to get 100% elongation is quite significant, PSI applied for 100% elongation. So, um, in temperature swings, that's another thing to consider if, if you have a certain face of a building um, that goes through a pretty significant temperature change. Again, um, the chemistry of your, of your sealants may, may have an effect on that in the movement capability and the stress being applied to those substrates. 
So getting to applications, um, there's quite a long list uh, here, as you can see, you know, I'll just name a few, you know, weather seals, structural glazing, um, EFS is one. I know that there was a symposium not too long ago uh, through AABEC on, on EFS. Um, restoration, you know, you name it. There's a lot of different applications here. Um, when it gets down to it, looking at installation and best practices. What are we looking for from design? So for example, when I go out into the field, what are, what are, what are we looking for? It is recommended for this hourglass shape. So you're looking for a two to one width to depth ratio. And what does that mean? You're looking for a two to one width, the, the total width of your joint here to depth. And the depth is this middle part of this joint. A lot of times what I'll see happen is when I get onto a job site, I'll do a pull test and they'll turn it over and they'll they'll measure this side. And they'll say, yeah, I got my got my two to one or oh, it's a little bit over my two to one, but this isn't the dimension you're you're measuring. When you think about it, the the point of failure is going to be the point where you have the least amount of sealant, and that's going to be this this middle point here in your hourglass. So that's the point where you want to measure and what we're talking about when we say a two to one. Now this two to one ratio um, only applies up to an inch. If your width dimension gets up to and past an inch, you want to maintain this middle dimension at a half inch and no more. Um, so key takeaway from this slide is more is not better. More sealant is not better because what can happen is again getting back to um, we'll say the movement you know of your sealant. So you have a 50% movement capability sealant and you put, I mean sometimes I see it where you got a you know, big old glob of sealant in here. Uh, you can actually cause failures because the sealant is so strong that it's holding it in within itself that as that thermal cycle happens of your building is expanding and contracting, the building's moving and the sealant's not going with it, it's staying within itself. So you can actually have an adverse effect where you think, ooh, more sealant is better, I'm helping, I'm helping keep water out of my building. You can have a reverse effect. So just word of caution. Uh, another dimension to keep in mind is this, this dimension here, what I call our bite um, or your surface contact area. You want a minimum of a quarter inch. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Another important point in this dimension here is your backer rod. Backer rod is extremely important um, for two reasons. One, to help you get this nice um, hourglass shape, which again is the desired shape. Um, but two, also to prevent three-sided Three-sided adhesion is not going to allow the joint to move as designed and again can cause potential issues whether it's with um, sealant failure, with substrate failure, it can, it can cause issues. So uh, three-sided adhesion is not recommended, not warranted, um, and the backer rod is required. And we'll get into some other applications here. So this just kind of summarizes some of those key points that I talked about. Per our recommend, each manufacturer varies a little bit, but per the Dow standards, um, joints up to four inches can be accommodated with silicone sealants, but I can tell you from field experience, um, once you get a joint that is that large, there becomes many other concerns, um, movement capability, be your movement being one, um, installation being another. There, you just a, a can of worms becomes open. So if you have joints that are that large, call your representative, call your waterproofer, call someone and talk it through. That joint um, warrants a little bit more discussion. So here are some examples. I'm a very visual learner, visual person. So uh, we have the good and the bad, as I was mentioning. So good joint design, we talked about dimension A here. Um, the minimum, which I didn't mention, uh, is a quarter inch. Uh, maximum up to four inch, but minimum is a uh, quarter. Uh, dimension B, your 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 two to one ratio. If your minimum is a quarter, your minimum width would then be an eighth. And then your C dimension, your bite again, minimum of an eight of a, a quarter inch. Over here on the poor joint design, you just have, again, as I was mentioning, big old glob of sealant. It's doing nobody any good. It's gonna cause potential failures um, and gonna most likely cause you to go over uh, your estimated budget um, on material costs. So no good for anybody. So you have next joint here, another example um, in, a, in a corner application. So poor joint design would be, you know, nothing here again, just kind of a cove bead, just 
put it there in the corner. This again is a moving joint. I, I would like to, to specify that. Um, we consider moving to be 15% or less. Um, that can be up for discussion. Um, but that's typically our, our internal standard. So the good joint design would be to have a backer rod or a bond breaker tape to prevent that three-sided adhesion. And again, uh, another point that I'd like to make on this good joint design is dimension C here is at least a quarter inch. So that's very, very important. Uh, no matter what design it is, you want a quarter inch um, bite um, on the sealant to the substrate to allow for that movement. Kayla, I see your lips moving, but... Oh. Keeps putting me on mute. There we go. Uh, if the sealant is not applied at two to one ratio, will adding um, additional sealant meet the performance requirements or will the sealant need to be removed and replaced? If it's not applied in the two to one in meaning too little or too much? So, so I guess I'll answer both because that's what, that's what I realize it's a chat. So, so too little, um, certainly, I mean, adding more would, would do that. Um, if you're going back with the same material, um, the only caveat I would say, um, again, from just a, a practical application standpoint, if you're going back a year later, um, even a couple of weeks, just make sure that you're, you're doing your proper cleaning and installation practices um, before you, you um, tap over that sealant. Um, if it's too much, um, I would review, you know, consult your, your engineer on the job to, to review how much movement really is in that joint. Um, and, and really how consistent, try and, try and do more adhesion tests to isolate. Is it a certain area? Is it a certain drop? Is it just this, uh, is it just this one jam? Uh, or is it this entire elevation, right? So try and do some, some problem solving to try and figure out, um, where it is, um, in my experience, you know, on the, on, to err on the side of the contractor, it's very difficult to get one whole elevation exactly perfect with this two to one. As a manufacturer, I mean, I'm very realistic in that. So um, it's very common to see closer to a one to one, you know, even like three eighths in the middle, um, it, three eighths to a half inch if your joint is a, is a one inch wide, very common very acceptable. Um, where it becomes an issue is if that's, if you're way over that two to one ratio on the entire building. But again, uh, it's worth having the discussion and, and consulting with your, the engineer on the building and again, the anticipated movement in those joints. Good question. So, Next joint here, um, like another uh, joint, another practical um, a call that I get pretty frequently. Um, so you have, and, and one more that I'm, I'm seeing more frequently in window systems. So a lot of times we'll see, maybe you have a, a membrane flashing here, right? So maybe it'll go, it'll span both of these sealants. Maybe it'll just span the, the primary seal. Um, but I also often get the question, hey, I have to install, you know, in order to keep the project timeline, we have to install both of these beads simultaneously and to keep moving on, uh, you know, with our staging and with the project timeline. If that is the case, silicone sealants cure with moisture and, and air. So if you used, and you'll see in this poor joint design, the poor joint design is two closed cell backer rods. What this is preventing, uh, that air and that moisture to get to this primary joint, the one that's that's in the back. Um, and we've seen it happen where you go back, you know, a couple of years on the job and you you cut out your secondary joint, the one closest to the exterior, and you go into that, that primary, the one that's in the back, and it's still not cure. It has happened, uh, and especially depending on the sealant, if it does have a slower cure um, matrix, it's happened um, and that can have an effect on, on performance and all those types of things. So the good joint design and what's recommended, again, if it's being installed simultaneously um, is open cell backer rod. There's obviously caveats depending on what your adjacent substrates are. For example, with EFs, EFs with open cell backer rod is not recommended, it's a big no-no. Consult your EFs manufacturers with that. Um, but this is, again, if it's installed simultaneously, um, that's what's recommended. 
similar story you'll see, I mean, both both the hourglass shape. I've actually had the question where, you know, Jennifer, if I install my primary bead, um, do I need a backer rod for my secondary? The answer is yes. There, there are two individually performing uh, beads of sealant. Um, so, so if, the, if that's how the system was designed, yes. I mean, because then your other concern is that you're creating, again, going back to the one of the first slides, a giant glob of sealant, which is gonna, gonna open another can of worms. So um, be cautious with your dimensions. Um, and a lot of this, again, comes, comes from the, the field experience and then just the, the downstream effects of, of the installation, you know, the not thinking through of, of, if I install it this way, what, it, what other dominoes are gonna fall as a result? We've got one more question. Um, there's a little confusion on the dual seal si slide. Mm -hmm. Is that concrete behind, behind the window mole? This looks like the upper portion of the window mole use expo um, is exposed to the elements. Yeah, I do. This, this detail is not the most clear. Um, this is this is concrete. So in this in this detail, um, this would be your primary. This would be your secondary, and this would be the exterior. Um, it's just it's just demonstrating a, a dual seal. Um, we see typically on 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 your window systems at the head and the jam. Well, I guess or head in the sill. Sorry, head in the sill. Okay, we had one more question uh, mm -hmm. about bicellular backer rod. Any concerns with curing? By cell, you mean like um, soft rod? Uh, I believe that's what that means. Okay. In my experience, no, we haven't we haven't seen that issue. Um, but to be to be safe, again, open cell in in at least one of those joints would be recommended. Soft rod, in my experience, is a, is a combination of the two, right? Because it's still kind of it's plot. It's not as rigid as a uh, closed cell, but it's still, if, I mean, if you're comparing the two, for those that are familiar with the, with the backer rods, it still does have that film on the outside. Uh, so again, from my experience, I haven't seen it cause any issues, um, but we have the data to support that an open cell backer rod is what's best recommended. Okay, good questions. And this, this is one of the one detail, uh, an application that I get calls on a lot. Um, and now just another another point um, and comment that I, I get questions a lot on. Um, so say, for example, again, we talked about you have like maybe a, a peel and stick membrane in here um, and going back to the properties of the sealants, you know, adhesion. Maybe the sealant you want to use on the exterior um, does not get adequate adhesion to the membrane that you're using. Uh, maybe as, as your primary seal. So something to consider um, that you may need to use two different sealants for your primary and your secondary, depending on, again, products, depending on details and performance requirements. Here's another one I typically see, another detail I typically see in restoration. Um, this one is, so we just got done talking about the hourglass shape, right? So I'll have contractors tell me, Jennifer, you told me I need to have my hourglass shape. I did it, look at it, isn't it so pretty? Uh, I, did, you, I did my job, right? Hourglass, beautiful. Um, not quite in this application. So um, what you'll see here is this joint, um, this extrusion is itty bitty, mate like, eighth of an inch, maybe quarter at its thickest. So again, going back to one of those dimensions that we talked about that was very important is having a quarter inch um, bite of your sealant to your substrate that you're adhering to. Um, this doesn't meet that criteria. So even though it's an hourglass, and yes, it is a beautiful hourglass, it doesn't meet the design and installation requirements uh, that we talked about in those, those dimensions. So to meet that, what would be recommended is to bring it out onto the exterior um, where A and B dimensions are a quarter inch. I get a lot of pushback with this on some building owners because it doesn't look as um, 
clean or maybe as pretty as they would have liked, but from a performance standpoint, this the 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 joint on the the joint design on the left is going to outperform the one on the right in the long term. So there are uh, sealants can also be used uh, typically in um, it, uh, non structural glazing for for internal seals, you know, on your window systems, you know, end dam screw heads, splice joints, those types of things. Uh, butt joints is another one. Um, to my knowledge, no, we have not come out with a sealant that, that does not that is clear and does not have air bubbles for butt joints. We're still working on it. Um, Another example of, you know, non-structural weather seals, um, silicone cap bead here. You're looking for quarter inch adhesion on the glass there and on your metal. That quarter inch bite is, is critical because thinking about it, as your building components are moving, if your sealant doesn't have enough to grab onto, it's going to cause failures, right? And we'll get into that more. Um, as we talk about potential, you know, causes of failures. So splice joints, uh, this example specifically here um, is replacing um, old sealant. So it can be done a couple ways, you know, but the best joint design here, um, you're looking for three eighths uh, sealant on each side. And then you're running in this application, uh, it's a preformed silicone seal over the old sealant. I believe I have a visual of what that looks like um, later on. But again, this this flat strip here um, is not a tooled liquid sealant. It's a it's a preformed silicone sealant. Typically seen in restoration. Um, typically seen to cover cover old sealant. Most often most often on EFIS restoration. And I have a, a a few slides specifically on EFIS. So we can talk about that as well. There are a few important points with that. So sealant installation um, and best practices. So our recommendation, clean, dry, frost-free. Don't really have much of an issue with frost-free down here in Texas, except you know, maybe one or two days in you know, January or something. Um, dew point can be an issue. You know, uh, I guess rule of thumb is if there's dew on the ground, most most likely can be due in your joint. So um, do what's called a tissue test. You know, take a tissue, put it in the joint. If you pull it away and there's any moisture, uh, I'm sure there's a, again the engineer on the on the project may have a lot more more technical um, and precise quantif quantifiable ways to to measure moisture. But this is just quick and dirty um, ways that that I've seen and, and done. Uh, to, to check for moisture, but you put the tissue in the joint and you pull it away. If there's any sign of moisture, um, the, the joint's too wet to, to install. If there's no sign of moisture, typically you're good. Uh, priming may be recommended. So in the order of installation, clean, very, very important uh, that the substrate be, be cleaned. Um, I believe I have some slides, some, some points in here on different types of cleaners. Um, Priming as recommended, depending again on the performance characteristics of the sealant. Then install your backer rods. Recommended that your backer rod is size 25% larger than the joint, um, and that's just for the the fact that so your backer rod doesn't flop into your joint if it is open in the back. Then recommended to install your sealant and then tool. Um, wet tooling is not recommended. Um, for the, the sole purpose of, for example, if your guys understand, you know, I hear the, the comments pretty frequently of if you wet tool, you get a nicer sheen to it, you know, it's easier it's to, to clean. I mean, every, I've heard every excuse in the book, but if you're introducing other solvents, whether it's dish soap, any kind of clean, I mean, any, any other chemicals into that sealant as you're wet tooling, what you're doing is introducing other chemicals and affecting with the designed uh, chemical processes of the sealant to its cure. So you can affect the cure uh, and adhesion properties of that sealant. So that's why we don't recommend wet tooling. So for field adhesion tests, this is what we do to verify um, 
you know, that the, the joint dimensions and that adhesion is looking good on the job site. Um, for those that haven't seen one or haven't um, done one, we do recommend these on all job sites. So pretty easy to do. Um, you, what you're gonna do is cut about two inches down on either side as close to the substrate as possible. Then pull the sealant at a 90 degree angle, um, not too fast um, as to rip the sealant out of the, the wall, but again, you're checking for adhesion. And different, oh, important, important note on here is different sealants have different pass fail criteria. So again, going back to the different pr uh, properties of the sealants, um, they, for example, if your sealant has 100% movement capability, if you, you can pull that sealant out 10 inches from the wall and it may not snap. If your sealant has 25% movement capability, you may only be able to pull it two inches from the building and it may snap. So different sealants have different pass fail criteria and check with your manufacturers to, to verify that. And restoration specifically um, for cleaning, the best recommended way uh, we always say is grinding off the old sealant. Um, that's gonna get you as close to the original substrate as possible, um, which is gonna get you, it's gonna take a lot of the guesswork out of adhesion. Um, We talked about bridge joints, for example, right here, which very similar to the, the one, two, three that we were talking about. Um, another application I see it used in is um, over these mullions, as you can kind of see, it's, where's my pointer? I lost it. So you can see here, kind of bridged over, over these mullions in a restoration project. Here's my picture. Here's the picture I was looking to show for the, the bridge uh, seal. So you're cleaning your substrate, installing two beads of sealant, and then rolling in this um, pre cured silicone strip over your existing sealant. This can be used in many different ways. It doesn't just have to be used in. Um, like I said, covering over old sealant, um, again, most likely in, in EFS applications. Seen it used in a lot of different ways, um, and it does have a higher movement capability than the sealants. So if movement capability is a concern, if you need more movement in your joint than a liquid sealant can accommodate, a pre cured silicone sealant might be a solution that you're looking for. There can be some custom uh, designs that you're looking for. If you want to go over, again, maybe a mullion cap, some corners, some kind of funky design. Eves, here we are. So it is recommended with Eves um, that a low modulus sealant be used just because it is pretty delicate and you can get delamination as we're seeing here. Um, and a stiffer sealant can, can cause this. Um, it's important if for EFS or stucco, if you're installing sealant, that the sealant be installed to the base coat and not the top coat. Um, a good rule of thumb is that the sealant is only as good as what it's adhering to. So if you remember, the sealant needs a quarter inch bite on its substrate to perform. So if you're installing your sealant on top of this top coat, which has all this aggregate in it, um, you're taking away your total dimension of that quarter inch bite to the substrate because now the sealant's not adhering to the substrate, it's adhering to part of this aggregate. So when you have an adhesion test and you, and you pull it away, what you're gonna see, if there's a failure, you're gonna see a lot of aggregate on that sealant um, for that failure. So for ease restoration, which can be even, uh, trickier trickier situation, um, the one, two, three is we recommended because with, with Eve says and how delicate it is, um, grinding is is not really an option. So the one, two, three uh, is a good, or the, the pre-cured silicone strip is a good option to to coat over that sealant um, and still maintain that, that waterproof barrier as well as going over it with a, a silicone elastomeric coating.
very cost effective as well. So in this example here, this, this visual is showing what that pre-cured silicone strip looks like installed over an existing joint. I refer to it as a silicone band-aid for your building. So silicone elastomeric coating um, can span up to uh, cracks up to 1 16th of an inch. It's 50% solids by weight can be applied by roller, uh, spray or blush, br br blush, brush. Uh, and it's uh, 10 mil dry film thickness. It's water-based, which is another um, important, important note there. So the silicone elastomeric coating, um, again, if you think back to the, the chemistry of it, it's going to have a longer performance than your typical organic-based coatings. So it's been used on, on many projects before. Um, you know, lots of lots of EFIS, concrete stucco, you know, many on, on porous, porous substrates. It is a, a permeable coating, high permeability, and again, 100% silicone. So the UV resistance um, and long longevity and performance of silicone. Jennifer, does it help uh, stop cracking in stucco? Yeah, so up to the 16th of an inch, it's going to seal that up, right? But if there's any cracks that are larger than that, that's going to be, um, it, it can be, I mean, structural. So, so it's hard to tell, especially without, without having, oh, I mean, kind of a, a root cause analysis or having, having some sort of evaluation done on, on the cause of that cracking. Um, it it can it can span that for the time being, but again, if there's a larger underlying issue, it's I mean it's not a it's not going to be a, a wonder a wonder um, gap filler if that if that's the term I'm looking for a gap filler. It's 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 not that it's going to coat over it and 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 weather weatherproof the building. So does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. I think so. Uh, when we've had, I've, I work for a, a big builder. When we've installed it at construction, I have wondered if it would assist in helping our stucco facade to crack less, you know, or in a sense, almost holding things together a little better um, rather than just being a fix later to cover cracking. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good question. And again, not being in the lab, having some of that data to, to support that, I, I can't claim it. But I mean, with its elastomeric properties, um, it could. It's a good thought. But I don't have, I don't have the data to back that up, unfortunately. That's... That's where I'm at, so, but very good point. So, do you have a couple, couple more slides here? Uh, staining of sensitive substrates. Um, understanding that this can be a very large concern for some building owners. Um, so, there are stain testing, uh, there is a, ASTMs that can be performed um, evaluating stain testing um, and stain warranties can be offered um, if this, this stain testing is, is performed. The, has any, well, if I'm in person, typically ask, has anybody seen this staining before? But since we're virtual, um, I will refrain from, from asking that question. But uh, once this staining is done, really the only solution to fix this is to take all of these panels down off of the building and replace them. There is absolutely no fix. Um, no power washing, no cleaning solvent in the world is going to get the staining out. So, um, and that's a result of the free fluids in the sealant leaching into, you know, leaching into the, the substrate. Um, there are also sealants, so there are sealants, um, again, can be tested for the staining if that is a large concern for some of your, your clients. Uh, clean silicone sealants um, is another one. 
that some sealants are specifically formulated for lower uh, dirt pickup or for, for building owners that are more concerned with aesthetics long-term of their building. Um, silicones historically have a reputation um, because of their longevity and their performance. They also, because they last a long time, um, they can also, they also can pick up the atmospheric dirt and dust over that time that they can last. And without preventative and continuous maintenance on these buildings, um, that can be a cause for concern for some, for some building owners. So there are certain sealants that are formulated for lower dirt pickup. Parking structure sealants, um, there are different types of, of joints here. Um, you have expansion control joints and uh, uh, vertical joints. We have some examples of design here, some important no notes. Um, with all these joints, you want to make sure that they're a quarter inch recessed because again, as the, the building expands and contracts for, for traffic, when without that quarter inch recess, if your, your joint compresses, as tires go, go over your joint, it's going to shred your sealant. So the recess is extremely important for that. Um, here's an example of the self-leveling. Uh, you'll see, you know, the three-sided adhesion is also a concern here. So in the, the good joint design, you have your bond breaker tape or your backer rod um, as well. Sandblasting is a recommended method of cleaning. And here's an example. Structural glazing. Um, there, there's two main categories, four-sided and two-sided uh, silicone structural glazing. Uh, the only sealants that, the only uh, chemistry of sealants that can be used in structural glazing is silicone, again, for that longevity. Um, you can see really the, the main difference here. So you have your, your two-sided here where you have your mullion and your, your structural silicone here is on the side. And then you have your weather seal. This is, you're looking at a, a top-down view. Um, and then in your cross-section view, you, your mullions are gone and you have your four-sided structural sealant all the way around. It's recommended that the structural glazing be done in shop. Uh, it can be done in the field, however, extra, um, quality measures should be taken into account. There are certain design guidelines. Um, due to time here, we can I want to be respectful. Um, but let me get to this detail here. So this is what we're, we're here. So your glue line thickness, um, more than quarter inch, your, your bite uh, is going to be calculated on your wind loads and, and several other characteristics. Um, your dead load, for example, your bite it, uh, is, you know, your weight of glass times your sealant contact length um, times your sealant design strength. You have some splice joints. Uh, again, your, your best design for these. There's good, better, and best. And protective glazing is one I also get a good uh, amount of questions on. Um, more so in the Florida market, but but some down here, um, especially along the coast, um, windows that use laminated glass um, and, and different uh, missile impact tests. There are certain sealants that are rated and approved for protective glazing applications, uh, as well as blast resistant. If anybody's ever seen one of these uh, these tests, they're actually pretty interesting for for me and my engineering background. It's uh it's pretty cool. I like to break stuff in the lab, so it's interesting to see. How sealants fail, uh, there's three different um, kind of categories, we'll say adhesively, meaning that the sealant failed to adhere to the substrate, cohesively, meaning that the sealant pulled apart from itself, and deterioration, which again goes back to its, its chemistry backbone. The sealant, or this slide looks a little out of place, but this is getting back to the impact re re resistant. We have your film and then a bead of your of the sealant here. A quick question, I'll be brief. Does structural silicone glazing joints, do they move less than the traditional perimeter sealant joints move? Your structural sealants, um, 
What do, you, what do you mean by move less? I saw in one of your details how uh, there was a big plug of sealant uh, behind the glass. And like we wouldn't, we wouldn't caulk like that at a typical perimeter mm -hmm. seal, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I wondered, yeah. like that's just all for adhesion's sake, I'm guessing, Correct. right? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is this is the so in structural structural glazing. Yeah, it's the especially in four sided. It is the silicone that is the only thing holding this pane of glass to the building. Um, and some of the early structural glazing applications um, in buildings. One of the first buildings they actually did is um, it freaked the public out so much that they actually had to go back and mechanically fat or not mechanically fasten, but put fake clips on with silicone sealant on the exterior of the building. So it looked like um, the glass was was held on by something mechanical when really it was just put on with more silicone. Um, so yes, that is why. Um, so so when you're looking at specifications or or applications of sealants, there's two very, very, very different applications. There is weather seal, which we're talking building envelope, waterproofing, and then there is structural which is glass and glazing. Two very, very, very different applications, uh, different design requirements, um, different sealant performance characteristics. So, good question. So here's some really cool projects that have been done. Um, for example, uh, Magnificent Mile, Organic sealant failed after two years, redone with silicone, so on and so forth. A lot of really cool projects. I'm sure we all have lists of, of projects um, that we're all really proud of. So in, in the end, the big one, a um, couple of key takeaways, chemistry. Um, main difference, organics and inorganics is the longevity. Um, not saying that there's no place for organics in construction. Um, just, you know, take a look at where, where it's going to be on the building, what's going to be on the exterior, interior, and what you're looking for. Um, versatility, one also, we didn't talk much about this, but, you know, keep the contractor in mind, too, in, in your specifications and what you're looking at. Um, we talked about the different modulus and different types of, of properties you can have on your, for your sealants. And while, yes, we as manufacturers offer seven different types of sealants, um, don't have seven different types of sealants on your job site. That's, you're asking for human error there um, for your contractor to put them in, in the right, right spots. So um, simplicity and versatility is, is key when looking at your specifications and applications um, of your sealants. There's a couple other ones, aesthetics, you know, your value and, and proven performance um, are all yeah, tied in with, with silicone for both new and a restoration construction. So with that, any other questions? I have four minutes. Um, Jennifer, if, if you're happy with sliding your, uh, sharing your slides, how can people get a hold of you to get those slides from you? Would you prefer them email me or can they email you directly? Are you okay uh, sharing? They can email me directly if I can figure out how to put something in this chat. I can put my email. Okay, here it is, chat. <laughs> um, so this is my email. You can also share the file through Zoom. Oh, see, we use WebEx, so I'm I'm a new I'm a I'm a newbie to this whole Zoom Zoom world. Thank you. Um, so I just put um, my email there in the chat. If you guys have any other questions specifically to um, for me, let me know. Okay. I know. Uh, I believe we also captured the attendees, so we will. We'll figure out how to get you the slides. We'll make it happen. Yeah, this was very helpful information. If uh, I could have that in its basic form, I can share that with my office, with my uh, operations group. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely.
Well, it looks like there's no more questions in the chat. Thank you, Jennifer. This was really a useful presentation. And You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, a couple minutes for for those still on. Um, if you have any questions specifically about, so I mean, we talked kind of broadly, you know, what the Dow sealants are. So for the um, and we talked about the two categories of the weather seal and the structural the dow weather seal sealants 790 is going to get you um the best unprimed adhesion to um, porous substrates um again pending adhesion test but it's going to give you 100 percent um elongation in tension 50 percent compression um 791 and seven uh what I'll say, I guess, really the workhorse and what contractors are most familiar with is 795. It comes in the most colors. Um, it's most familiar, again, to, to most contractors. Um, it's also probably in the most specifications. Um, so 795 is, is the most versatile. This sealant also can be used in, in structural applications. So when talking about the um, simplicity and keeping the contractor in mind, if you do have structural and weather seal applications, 795 um, is going to is going to help them. Um, CWS or contractors weatherproofing sealant and, and contractors concrete sealant do have lower movement capabilities, um, but they are um, on a more economically priced scale um, and do have a lower warranty. Um, the top three 790, 791, and 795 have 20 year warranties, um, whereas the bottom two have 10 year warranties. There's one question that came in regarding the 795 in gray. It had issues in the past regarding integrity. Has this been reviewed? Has that been upgraded by Dow or? I'd be curious um, that question, what, what type of integrity, I mean, what specific application um, and how long ago? It sounds like a pretty specific application. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, okay, so SSG and curtain walls. Um, so uh, seven, specifically in the Northeast. So 795 um, for SSG, if you're doing SSG, 795 is going to be one of the slower curing sealants for SSG. Uh, a two component is probably going to be um, best recommendation. Again, it's all going to be situation dependent. Um, I'm not familiar with any specific issues in the Northeast. Um, we do have, I mean, folks like myself located all over the U.S. Um, be interested to know how long ago that specific instance was as well. Um, yeah, well, uh, if we can get that. Yeah, we, we, we can talk offline. Uh, Joseph, um, but again, my and email then, is in the chat. Yeah. Uh, what silicone can seal window frames to an air barrier flashing? Ah, the million dollar question. So each air barrier flashing uh, is going to be a little bit different. Um, so if it's polyethylene backed, 790 uh, gets gets pretty good adhesion. Um, but if you want to sure, I, I have to be careful how I frame this. Um, but for for best results, 758 is going to be um, the silicone sealant. It's going to get adequate adhesion to not only the air barrier flashings, but also to um, your membrane. Downside to the 758, um, and actually I have a slide on that uh, somewhere. Maybe I don't. Um, but 758, it only comes in white because it was only designed to be used uh, as a primary seal. Uh, and it only has a 25% movement capability. So a couple, couple caveats there, um, but 758 is, is going to be the one that's going to meet those, those criterias. Um, if you have specifics, um, because I, I mean, we do this all the time, so the Dow Laboratory does project specific testing. Um, so you're more than welcome to send the substrates into the Dow Lab if you have specifics um, or give me a call or send me an email and I can review and let you know what historic testing that we have um, because Dow's been doing this a very long time. So we do have a very long history of testing and performance with a lot of, a lot of these different air barrier membranes. 
Um, I have a question regarding staining. Do mm -hmm. you, what do you see, what material gets the staining the most and then what does the testing require? Like, what does it involve? So what, I mean, the sensitive substrates stain the most. Like so if you have, or... yeah, if you have like a crazy, like Italian marble or like a, um, yeah, the, the very sensitive stones. Um, as far as requirements for the stain testing, it is lengthy. So it does, it's, it can't be like a, hey, quick, do this in your garage kind of a thing. You do send the substrates into the Dow lab. It is an ASTM. Um, it's about a six to eight week turnaround. But again, once that testing is performed and if the, the results are, are positive, um, then you can ob obtain a stain warranty. And this can be done with any of the, the weather seal sealants. Um, so the 795, the 79. So for example, if you're the folks in your field are very comfortable and like their 795 and they don't want to switch to anything else, you can test the 795 for staining. Well, I think we've hit our time. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And thanks everybody for attending and all your great questions. Yes, Good thank you everyone in a few weeks. Everyone stay safe. Yes. <laughs>